Hi there, welcome to Southside Baptist Church's Sermon Audio Podcast. To learn more about us, you can check out our website at southsidesbc.org, or you can go to our Facebook page. If you'd like to connect with us, you can send us an email at info at southsidesbc.org. If this podcast has been a blessing to you, please go on to your podcast platform and leave us a positive review to help others find our content more easily. Thanks for listening and have a great week. We are continuing this morning in our series through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And I know those are two books that um, are not well-known books of the scriptures. Uh, so if you are new with us, let me kind of give you up, bring you up to speed just a little bit. We're talking about the Israelites in the Old Testament. We're talking about them being brought back, God bringing them back to their homeland. And so they had been um, taken out of their homeland. They had been exiled, God, because of their sin, because of their disobedience to him and their worship of foreign gods. God had allowed them to be conquered and many of them, a good portion of them, to be carried away in a couple different waves off into exile and dropped in other places, Babylon and Assyria and so forth. And they were allowed to be exiled for about 70 years. And then God began to do what he promised to do. And just like he promises to us to bring us to him, right? He promised to bring them back to the land and not all of them, but a remnant of them. What we have seen through this series in Ezra and Nehemiah is it started with um, the first wave of exiles coming back with Zerubbabel and Jeshua. And then Ezra um, led a second wave back. And this morning, as we are kind of still getting into the book of Nehemiah here, we are seeing a little bit of this third wave, which was really led by Nehemiah. It doesn't appear to be a, a, a lot of people with him, but um, we're seeing uh, Nehemiah go back to do something that God had called him to do. I want to start out with a story as we talk about this morning, uh, stepping out in faith. A lady by the name of Cicely Saunders was a British nurse and social worker back in the 1950s who later trained to be a doctor. As a nurse, what she discovered in 1950s England was that hospitals had no idea of what to do with patients who were dying. Doctors would tell the family when somebody got to that stage that, that there was nothing more that they could that could be done, nothing more they could do for them. And she said nothing more was done for the suffering person. Cicely Saunders had become a Christian and as such refused to accept that. So she spent seven years researching pain control and working among the dying. She began dreaming of a place that would serve cancer patients but she was afraid of stepping out and asking for financing for what would be the world's first purposely built hospice house. Then one day she read a scripture, Psalm 37, five, that says this, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. So in 1967, Cicely Saunders opened St. Christopher's Hospice House in London, England. It was there, that was the first hospice house, evidently, that, that, uh, ever. It was there where they did pioneering research on using morphine for pain control. And unlike hospitals, in her hospice, a patient could garden, they could get their hair done, that's important. They could enjoy art or music or drama. Cicely believed you matter because you matter to God. You matter until the last moment of your life. Her work helped to create a new specialty in medicine, which we're, most of you are probably familiar, familiar with now, called palliative care. And when euthanasia began growing in Europe, Cicely Saunders strongly opposed it because of her Christian faith and because she had shown that effective pain control is possible. In 2005, Cicely Saunders passed away from breast cancer. And she passed away at the very hospice house in which she had started. In a culture 
that viewed a dying patient as a medical failure, Cicely Saunders taught the world how to view that same patient as a person. She felt God's leading to do something about she had, the problem she had seen, and then she stepped out and did something about it. Friends, like Cicely Saunders, I, I want to ask a question this morning. When God calls us to do something, when God lays something upon your heart, when we feel his spirit leading, do we have the faith to step out and do what he's called us to do? I believe that's the question um, that many times we wrestle with, but I believe it's also the question um, that Nehemiah dealt with in our text today. Nehemiah, and last week, you remember in chapter 1, Nehemiah had found out that Jerusalem was not in good shape, right? The walls were still torn down, the gates, all of that was not in good shape, uh, and that the Jewish remnant there was struggling and in great distress, He'd wept over the situation. He'd poured his heart out to God in prayer over it repeatedly, over and over and over again. And as a result of that, he felt the need to do something about it. But how was he to do that? Here Nehemiah was. He was a cupbearer in the king's palace, right? He was uh, a thousand miles away, four months, remember the, the journey, was four months away, um, he had responsibilities there in the king's palace. Uh, he couldn't just pick up and go. Um, how was he supposed to do something about this? How was he supposed to, 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 to make a difference? How was he, uh, what was he to do about this? What was his next step? If he was going to do something about this, if he was going to follow what God had laid on his heart, what was he going to do? What was his next step to be in order to follow God's leading and what he felt God leading him to do. Well, friends, I believe we find the answer to what he did in our text today. I believe it's a, a couple of things that will help us and maybe help us to be able to step out in faith as well. I would tend to guess that many of us today would say that we felt before we felt God leading us to do something and we haven't done it. I believe today we see three steps of faith that Nehemiah took, and the first one actually may surprise you. So if you got your outline this morning, take a look at this with me, if you will. First of all, friends, Nehemiah stepped out in faith. He had the faith to wait on God. Nehemiah had the faith to wait on God. He had heard about those Jewish, the struggles, right? The remnant that was struggling. He'd heard about how the walls were torn down. It concerned him greatly. He felt like he needed to do something. He could have said, you know what? I'm going and nobody's going to stop me. That's what many of us would have done. And you know what? There, that, there's a part of which that's admirable. Um, the problem is if Nehemiah had done that, he probably would have been arrested before he got out of town. He had a responsibility. He was the king's cupbearer. He couldn't just abandon his post. So friends, that's not what he did. You know what Nehemiah did? He waited and he prayed. He prayed for God to open a door. Look at chapter two, beginning in verse one. It says, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, the, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, was Paul's right there, okay? So I mentioned this last week, but a lot of times when we go from one chapter to the next, in our mind, boom, it just happens right, you know, this with no time lapsed. But there actually is a time lapse. What we see here is now it's Nisan in the 20th year, the month of Nisan, which uh, I believe is our um, mid-March to mid-April. Chapter 1 had told us it, uh, that he had got the report in the month of Kislev, which is November to December. So about four months had passed, four months later until we get to chapter 2, verse 1. When it says, it came to pass when wine was before him that I took the wine and gave it to the king. So the events that are going to transpire didn't happen exactly immediately after chapter one, but there was four months in between. Let me ask you a question. What was Nehemiah doing in those four months? He was praying and he was waiting. It says, when I was before him, I took 
the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had never been sad in his presence before. That sounds a little like an odd statement, doesn't it? I've never been sad. I, I, I took the king his wine, and he's getting ready to tell us something else, but he says, I'd never been sad in the presence of the king before. Now, um, it's an odd statement to make because for us, you know, we're happy, we're sad. It usually shows, right? <laughs> but as a servant of the king, it didn't matter his problems, didn't matter what was going on at home, didn't matter how he felt about whatever, friends, if, they were, if you were a servant of the king, you were expected to keep your feelings hidden and to be cheerful around the king. You know why? Because the king didn't want to mess, didn't want to be bothered with your drama. Right? The king doesn't want that. He didn't have time for that. You know? And so that's why he said, I'd never been sad in his presence before. Um, it was be happy or else face the wrath of the king. And that was a very real thing in that day. Verse two, look at it with me. Nevertheless, this time Nehemiah couldn't hide his feelings. Now I would tend to guess that Nehemiah these four months, he'd been having, you know, he felt this way before. He just, it, it had just really gotten overwhelming to him. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So the king recognized that he was heartbroken over something, right? So he says, I became dreadfully afraid. So Nehemiah was trying to hide it, but it was too much. The king noticed his sadness of heart, noticed him being depressed, and um, Nehemiah was therefore terrified. He, he noticed it. I, what in the world am I going to do? He knew what the king could do to him. So he became dreadfully afraid. Verse 3, and said to the king, may the king live forever. Now, that's pretty much because kind of a common statement, right? You'd say before the king, long live the king, right? Long live the queen, as the Brits say. Um, but that was a really a, a, a statement to, of, of uh, uh, it was a statement to honor the king, if you will. There are a couple of different reasons why he said that. Um, first of all, he wants to quickly affirm his loyalty to the king. Um, you know, he wanted to make sure the king knew that he wasn't sad because he was hiding some, something that he was going to, um, you know, subvert the king or do some, some plot against the king. So he quickly affirms his loyalty to the king. I believe out, out of the relationship, it's a genuine concern for his well-being. You know, long, long, I, this is not about you, king, right? My sad, I believe ultimately he's saying my sadness is not because of you. Long, may the king live forever. Then he continues on, but he says this. He says, why should my face not be sad? So, King, this is not about you, but why should my face not be sad when the city, notice he doesn't mention the name of the city at this point, um, the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. So, um, instead of mentioning Jerusalem, remember King Artaxerxes had made a proclamation um, earlier, some several years before about that, um, he appeals to the king's sympathy. Uh, Nehemiah appeals to, to King Artaxerxes' sympathy by stressing, this is the place where my fathers are buried. How can I not be sad when the city where my mom and dad are buried is lays in ruins? And he appeals to King Artaxerxes' heart. Now, as we think about this situation here where... where um, this situation has started to unfold. What, is, what has Nehemiah done here? Uh, instead of barreling ahead on his own, instead of when he had a concern about the, 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 his homeland, when, all, when Jerusalem was burdening his heart, instead of saying, you know what, I'm just going to go, he waited. He waited on God to provide an opportunity for him to say something to the king. We saw in his prayer, um, this is not going to be on your screen, at the end of chapter one, he said, I pray, um, uh, let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So uh, he knew that he was, in order to go and do something about this, that God was going to have to move the heart of King Artaxerxes. And so instead of barreling ahead, Nehemiah waited and he prayed for God to do just that. 
He waited and he prayed and he prayed and he waited and he prayed some more and he waited and he prayed some more and he waited. You ever been there? And he prayed and he waited and he prayed and he waited. For four whole months, he prayed and he waited, trusting and waiting until God opened a door, until God provided an opportunity, friends, and that is exactly what God did. You know, um, the scripture continually tells us to wait on the Lord, doesn't it? Amen? Psalm 37, 7 says this, says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Friends, that's exactly what Nehemiah did. He didn't move forward on his own. He didn't decide, you know what, it's, I, he, I'm so determined, I'm just going to go do this. He waited on God. He rested in the Lord and waited for God to provide an opportunity. God's all, word also says this in Philippians chapter 4. Because I can imagine that Nehemiah, um, it was, listen, chapter 1, would you say Nehemiah was concerned or not concerned about Jerusalem and Judea? He was concerned about it, right? And so anytime we're concerned about something, it can consume us with worry, right? So Philippians 4 verse 6 says this, don't worry about anything, right? But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So friends, while we are waiting, while we are praying, while we don't know our next step, while we're looking for what to do next, what should we be doing? Praying. We should be praying. If we don't know how to proceed, if, we, if, we just, if we're waiting patiently on the Lord, friends, we need to continue to pray about Whatever situation's on our mind, whether it's a situation or a person or a family problem or whatever it is, friends, we need to lift it up to the Lord continually in prayer. You know, perhaps every morning, Nehemiah prayed something like this, Lord, if today's the day that you want me to talk to the king, please open a door for me to do that. Um, Lord, if today's the day, if you want to do it some other way, Lord, then show me, Lord, show me what you want. Open a door, Lord, for me to be able to go back and help my people in Jerusalem. Friends, maybe we ought to pray something similar, amen? You know, if there's a situation on our heart that, that, um, that God's laid on our heart, Maybe it's a situation with some friends, or maybe it's a situation in our family, or maybe it's a situation at work. Uh, maybe it's, a, so, uh, it's someone who, who, who is, we know need, needs to know the Lord, and we're just, we're, we're, we know we need to, God wants to use us, and God's laid them on our heart, or that situation, or whatever. We know that that situation needs Jesus in it. Friends, we need to pray for that, you know? And maybe we feel like we can do something about that. Maybe instead of barreling in, just pray, God, Open a door for me to be used in that situation. God, if you want me to step into it, open a door. You know, I can't tell you how many times uh, I've been wondering, you know what, do I need to do something about this? Do I need to whatever? And, and there are sometimes God leads me that, yeah, I need to take the initiative. I need to go. But I can tell you how many times I, I, I prayed about that. Well, Lord, if you want me to do something about that, then, then you open the door and I get a phone call or something happens that opens that door to, to be able to step in to help that situation and help the situation be led towards Christ. Friends, um, there's, but let me say this also, okay? Because when we talk about waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord doesn't mean never doing anything. We can kind of use that as an excuse, can't we? Well, you know, pastor, I'm just waiting on God. Well, man, you've been waiting on God for the last 50 years. Get off your duff and do something. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You know, you know people like that, right? You know? They've been, they've been waiting for direction from God for 70 years now and have never done nothing. Sorry. Patience does not mean to delay when it is time to act. Patience simply means to wait until you have clear direction from God. Until God opens a door. Friends, but when God opens that door, what are we supposed to do? Walk through it. Amen? We're supposed to walk through it. And I believe many times that's where we fall short. 
Okay, let me not get ahead of myself, friends. I believe that's exactly what Nehemiah did next. It's the second step of faith we're going to see Nehemiah take in our text today. So number two, not only did Nehemiah have the faith to wait on God, friends, Nehemiah had the faith to walk through the open door. He had the faith to walk through the open door. Look at verse four. Let's see what happens next. Verse 4 says, after he shared why his face was sad, why his countenance was sad, then the king said to me, what do you request? In other words, what do you want? What, how can I help you? Now, friends, obviously I believe here that we see God at work in the king. Amen? The king could have said, how dare you bring your junk into my, into, into my palace? You're supposed to leave that at home and happy face in fear. But he didn't. Friends, God had softened the king's heart towards Nehemiah. I believe also um, that probably because of Nehemiah's relationship with the king, um, the king's heart, God had used that to soften the king's heart as well. And the king simply asked, what do you request? So look at what it says in verse 4 here. It says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. Now, Folks, this is not one of those prayers where he's talking with the king and all of a sudden the king says, uh, what can I do for you, Nehemiah? What do you want? He doesn't stop and say, excuse me just a minute. Oh, dear God, please help me with this. Well, you know, that's not, listen, this is one of those, you ever been in that situation where God has provided an opportunity or something has happened and you are just praying under your breath, right? <laughs> Lord, please help me. It's not even audible. It's in your head. Lord, Okay, Lord, this is it. This is it, Lord. Give me the strength. Give me the words. Help me know what to say. You know, you can do all of that really quickly. God help me, right? That's what Nehemiah was doing here. So look at verse 5. He prays to God under his breath, saying, Lord, this is it, Lord. Give me, the, give me the words to say. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king. Now, notice here he puts it in the king's, Right? This is not, God told me this, king. No, if, if, you would, if it pleases you, king, and that, that was what he had to do. And if your servant has found favor in your sight. Listen, I might go into this a lot, but this is why it's important to treat people right, whether, they are, whether they're nice to you or not, okay? You never know when you may need favor from somebody who is not a believer, Okay? And so even in witnessing to them, even in helping them, um, you know, we need to understand. He said, if your servant has found favor in your sight, look at what he says. He says, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. So Nehemiah appeals to the king. He says, okay, king, listen, um, if you would allow this, and if, I, if I've found favor in your sight, would you allow me to go back? He asks the king to be able to go back and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. So, verse 6, then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him. Now, honestly, I've looked for what people might say about why in the world does it mention that the queen is sitting beside him? I don't know. Um, I haven't really found anything, so it's just conjecture. I don't know if the queen sitting beside him might have um, tempered or helped his mood a little bit. <laughs> um, I don't know why, why that's there, but it was the king and the queen. How long, the king asked, will your journey be and when will you return? So here the king just simply asked, okay, Nehemiah, you want to be, you want to go do this. How long are you going to be gone? Now, as we, as we read on here in just a minute, it doesn't say what, how Nehemiah answered him exactly. It doesn't say when Nehemiah said he would return, but here's what we maybe can piece a couple things together. Over in chapter 5, verse 14, Nehemiah tells us that he was in um, Judea, Jerusalem, in that area for 12 years as governor, okay? Now, to me, and this is, again, this is conjecture on my part um, because the scripture doesn't say, it seems unlikely to me that Nehemiah at this point when he asked to go rebuild Jerusalem that Nehemiah would say, well, it's going to take about 12 years. That seems a little bit like, ah, I kind of doubt that's what it, it would happen. It's just conjecture. I don't know. Um, what we do know, and we'll find this out in, um, as we go continue in the book, it took, I believe it was 52 days for them to rebuild the walls of the city. Okay, pretty fast. Um, 
So I don't know if Nehemiah maybe said, hey, how about a couple, you know, let me be gone a couple of months or six months or whatever. And then later on, that time was extended, I would imagine. We don't know for sure. The scripture doesn't say, nevertheless, look at what it does say in verse six. So it pleased the king to send me and I set him a time. So Nehemiah, however long it was, Nehemiah um, set the time and the king said, okay, now, you ever asked for something that you really didn't think you were going to get and you were told yes? You're kind of giddy inside, right? <laughs> okay, I'm going to get that new toy or whatever it was. I don't know. Okay, and so, you know, I'm sure he's saying, oh, that's awesome. And, but he doesn't stop there, right? Nehemiah's like, doesn't hurt to ask. And look at verse 7. So furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, again, King, if you will, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. So Nehemiah evidently had given some thought to this and given some thought to the fact of here I am traveling back and that's a dangerous land and these people aren't going to want me traveling. King, would you give me letters to the governors allowing me to pass through to get back? And to which the king says, we're going to see in a minute, sure. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 8, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. So not only does he ask for letters to get through the land safely, but he also asks, can I have some wood? You know, it's kind of kind of expensive now. If you could let us have some beams and so forth, that would be great. Verse 8, and the king granted them to me, look at this, according to the good hand of my God upon me. So friends, Nehemiah asked for the moon. And guess what? He got it. But he recognized here that it was God who was giving him favor with the king. This wasn't him. It was God that had given him favor with the king. Friends, it was God who had opened the door for him to talk to the king about this in the first place, right? And it was God who was now giving him favor with the king as well. All he had to do was walk through those doors that God had opened and provided. The reality is, it takes faith to walk through those doors, doesn't it? It takes faith that God will help us. It takes faith that God will give us the words to say. If we're praying for God to open a door for us to share the gospel, which we should be. Listen, even when, how many times, you know, has God opened the door and, well, it takes faith, friends, that God will equip us with what we need. It takes faith that God will be with us the whole way. How many times have you gotten to the open door? right? Or gotten there and God's opened a door for the word. God's opened a door for you to minister to somebody. God's opened a, do a door and yet you failed to walk through it. Ever been there, done that? Maybe because we're scared. Maybe because we're afraid of the commitment that it'll take. Oh man, if I get involved in this and it's going to take this. Maybe, maybe we don't think we can do what God's asked of us. Friends, like I said a few minutes ago, it takes faith to walk through those open doors. We've got to trust that God is going to equip us. And listen, God's not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. And when you are available to him, friends, then he will equip you to do what he's called you to do. Amen? Think about this, okay? When we think about, we, we, listen, we could come up with every excuse in the book, Amen? Well, I, I, I'm scared of what might happen. Friends, Nehemiah, it says, was dreadfully afraid. Yet he walked through that door. Why? He trusted God with that. You know what? If God's opening this door, I got to walk through it and see what happens. Um, Moses. Moses had a speech impediment, right? He, he, uh, he, gave, and, and not only that, he gave God every excuse in the book, but when it came down to it, he walked through that door because he trusted God. God said, trust me, Moses, I will give you the words to say. The disciples, 
were men of little to no education, right? Peter even denied Christ three times, but they trusted the Lord and walked through the doors that he wanted them to walk through. Timothy thought he was too young. The apostle Paul had bad eyesight. We could come up with all sorts of excuses, friends. But in the end, we just need to trust the Lord. Will we trust God with it? It's not about your ability. It's about your willingness to be available to him. Are we willing to say yes? Are we willing to trust him with the rest? Amen? Are we willing to walk through those open doors when he blows them wide open? Nehemiah had the faith to wait on God, amen? He had the faith to walk through that open door when God opened it. And the third step of faith I believe we see in our text today is this, friends. Nehemiah had the faith to take ownership and responsibility. Nehemiah had the faith to take ownership and responsibility. So, Nehemiah has gotten the king's permission, right? He secured letters from the king for the governors of the region to let him pass through. He's even secured timber to build. That's awesome. And so he takes off, probably with his brothers. Not sure. The scripture doesn't tell us how many, if, uh, if any, others went with him um, other than some army soldiers. Look at verse 9. Verse 9, it says this, Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river. So they took off. He went to the governors and gave them the king's letters. Okay? Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. So um, there are a couple questions that come up this. Why would Nehemiah ask for an escort? We Remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about Ezra? And Ezra said he couldn't, he he was not going to ask for um, an escort. He wasn't going to ask for soldiers to go with him because that would tell the king that he wasn't trusting God. So why in the world does Nehemiah ask for this? Well, first of all, it doesn't say that he did. The scripture doesn't say here that Nehemiah asked for an army escort. In fact, what it says here is the king sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. The reality is that Nehemiah probably would have been considered on official business of the king, especially um, if he had, we don't know exactly when this happened, when he, at this point, even though it doesn't say it was already appointed governor or not, he would have been on official business of the king. And so um, as that, the king would have sent soldiers with him. Nonetheless, um, Nehemiah didn't ask for it. But look at verse 10. Verse 10 says this. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Now, it's unclear whether these two men were some of the officials to whom letters were given. Um, But what we do know is that they were leaders um, in the area around Jerusalem of the people of the land. In fact, um, Sanballat was um, uh, led up the army of the Samaritans, as we'll see in a couple of chapters, and uh, probably was 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 their leader, um, or probably not king, but their governor or leader or whatever it was uh, in that area. Uh, Tobiah uh, headed up the Ammonites. Um, Whether they received letters or not, I don't know, but they were leaders who hated God's people and hated God's work. They, these two guys will become some of the leading force of enemies against Nehemiah in the work of rebuilding the walls. And so here's the beginning of it. These two guys um, were disturbed that men had come to seek the well-being of the children, that Nehemiah had come to build up Jerusalem, had come to strengthen the Israelites. Look at verse 11. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Now, why not? Here we're going to see a little bit of secrecy here um, as Nehemiah begins to go out and survey the situation to see what condition the walls were in. Uh, Probably he didn't tell anybody because he didn't want news to get back to these enemies, right? He didn't want 
any of that. He didn't know how they were hearing about things. He didn't know what fingers they had in the situation. And so he arose at night and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse or dung gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and its gates, which were burned with fire. So he goes out to, to survey the situation. Then I went on to the fountain gate to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. So Nehemiah was secretive because he didn't want to stir up any of the opposition, but he surveys the wall going from west to south to east and back, focusing on the southern part of the city to check out the conditions, the condition of the walls. Then verse 17, he says, then I said to them, um, let me pause there for just a minute. Um, probably here the next day. Okay. Speaking to more of the Jews than just a, a small contingent that went with him. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. Now I want to pause there for just a minute and think about this. Um, here was this guy, Nehemiah. Who was Nehemiah? Think about this. He was, he was the cupbearer, right? He was cupbearer to the king of Persia. And of course, Persia, that was, that was the land and the king had sent him. But who was Nehemiah to the other Jews? Nobody. Thank you. He was nobody. He wasn't, um, he wasn't in the kingly line. He wasn't in the priestly line. He wasn't in the Levitical line. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a priest, Levi, any of that stuff to the Jews. Yet here he has come back under authority of the king. And he has said, uh, listen, let's rebuild. Let's rebuild this. Uh, Nehemiah is nobody special as far as their concern as a Jew. Yet he steps up to lead them into rebuilding. So how do they respond? Look at verse 18. He says, and I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me and also of the King's words that he had spoken to me. So he tells the people, listen, I got some good news to tell you. All right. God is in this. Okay. God has been working. God provided a door. God laid this on my heart. God opened a door and listen, I asked the King and I thought, man, he's going to be mad at me. But instead, guess what? He allowed me to come and he gave me letters and he let us have, have, have uh, timber and so forth. And so we can rebuild these walls. And so he tells them all of that. So they said, let us rise up and build. Listen, they needed some good news. Amen. And Nehemiah brought it. He said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. Friends, to their credit, the Jews in the land were ready to follow Nehemiah and build. Listen, they could have said, oh, Nehemiah, we tried that once and it didn't work. You know, Ezra chapter four tells us about when they, they started to try to, right after the temples, tried to start rebuilding the walls and um, the, that opposition in the land squashed it out. They could have said that, uh, Nehemiah, we tried that once, it didn't work, but they didn't. They were willing to follow him. They could have said, but Nehemiah, there's too much opposition in the land, friends, but they didn't. They were ready to get to work. How many excuses do we make for not following the Lord and what he calls us to do? I would say we're pretty good excuse makers, amen? Look what happens next in verse 19. Verse 19 says, but when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard, it, heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? Friends, here's what we need to remember. Whenever we, as God's people, step out in faith to do what God has called us to do, the enemy will always show up to try to discourage us. Amen? 
The enemy will always do everything he can to try to get us to quit or maybe even never start in the first place, friends. Listen, know that it will happen, amen? Don't be surprised by it. That's why the scripture tells us to put on the armor of God, right? The helmet of salvation and the, 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 the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and all of those things, friends, we put on the armor of God so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. Friends, don't let the devil discourage you from doing what God's called you to do. I want you to look at how Nehemiah responds. Man, this is a good example for us. Verse 20, so I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. In other words, this is God's work. Listen, God will give us success because it's his work. The God of heaven is with us. He says, therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. In other words, we're God's servants. Don't try to deter us. We're serving the Lord. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Satan, you have no hold here. This is property of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have no authority here. That's what they were saying. Our work is not your concern. Friends, I love this. Here was Nehemiah who had no official position as a Jew. Only the only authority he had was what the Persian king had given him, which was something, but that was only because he had asked friends. So the Jews didn't have to follow him in this. Yet Nehemiah took ownership and responsibility for the city of Jerusalem and for rebuilding its walls. That took Nehemiah trusting God to help him with the project. Amen? Nehemiah was a cupbearer. Did he even know how to build? Um, It took Nehemiah trusting God that the Jews would want to help. You know, when he left Persia, you know, listen, they had not rebuilt those walls in a hundred years. What made him think they were going to do it now? It took Nehemiah trusting God that he would keep their enemies at bay. Friends, if we press forward, we put on the armor of God, there is nothing, the devil will try to play mind games with you, but there is nothing he can do to you when you're serving the Lord and you're in the will of God. And here's the deal, friends, God will always help his people do what he has called them to do, amen? God will always equip us to do what he's called us to do. So here's the question. It brings us to this question. What is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to do? What does he want you to take ownership and responsibility of? Can I say this? I believe that's part of growing up as a Christian. You know, as a baby Christian, as a new Christian, if you are are new in your faith, in, in your walk with Christ, other people are pouring into us, right? And they're helping us to, to grow in Christ. And, 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 but what are they helping us grow into? Um, you know, oftentimes I think as Christians in the American consumer mindset, we are always thinking, well, I just need to, and listen, you'll hear me talk, we need to grow in our faith. Absolutely, we need to grow in our faith. But there comes a point at which, friends, we need to take responsibility and ownership for some things that God has, uh, has put into our lives some things that God has laid on our heart. Friends, um, maybe it's taking ownership or responsibility of a particular need that you've noticed. Something, uh, a spiritual need that you've noticed, and maybe, maybe at your work with somebody, or maybe it, you notice that, man, there's so many lost people here that I, maybe I ought to start a Bible study. Maybe taking ownership of that means saying, you know what, I'm going to do what I feel God calling me to do. I want to help meet this need. I'm going to meet this need. Maybe maybe it's taking responsibility for getting the gospel to somebody in particular. Listen, our One Life board is back here at the back. If you don't know about this, there are little cards on the One Life board, and and we put names on that. If you haven't done this, I would encourage you. Names of people that that you know are lost as a goose but need Jesus. What do you, are you, but the thing is not, yes, we want to pray for them, but would you take responsibility for sharing the gospel with them? 
for praying for them and saying, I'm going to keep telling this person about Jesus until they hate me or accept him as the Savior. Would you take responsibility for that? You say, well, pastor, that's up to God. I know it's up to God. God's the one who saves. We don't. But God uses us. Would you take ownership or responsibility for a certain ministry? Maybe that's here within the church. Maybe it's something else, friends. But would you say, I'm going to make sure that this ministry succeeds, that this ministry gets off the ground, whatever it is. But God has laid this on my heart. I'm going to take responsibility for that. I praise God for the leaders we have. I praise God. We've got wonderful leaders who uh, have taken ownership and responsibility in so many ministries. But listen, as we continue to reach people and as we continue to grow, guess what? We're going to need others to do the same thing. Um, Maybe it's doing something else to advance God's kingdom here on earth. Maybe God's laid something in your heart. You say, I feel called to do this and I'm going to take ownership of this. Let me just say, here's what every single one of those, no matter what it is, here's what it'll take, friends. It will take, number one, stepping up to the plate. Number two, it'll take doing what you say you will do. There's a lot of people that come to me and say, oh, pastor, say, we really need to do this, whatever. We do that. Yeah, they start and then they fizzle out. Third, it will take not just volunteering, friends, but it will take following through and sticking it out. Taking ownership means that. I want to close with a, a quick story uh, about a, a, a new church um, in a city where Laura and I used to live, Raleigh, right, we used to live right outside there, Raleigh, North Carolina. The name of the church is called Vintage 21, and, they, and I know it's a little bit of an unusual name for a church, but they are promoting a new concept, which honestly, when I first started reading this, I'm like, eh, don't know about that. The church has decided to eliminate the concept of membership. Now, if you know me, you say, Pastor, you're, I know you're against that. Um, normally, I would not be in agreement with this, and I'd still have to give it a lot of thought. But what they are doing is pretty intriguing. They have decided to ditch the idea of church membership entirely in favor of something they believe is more a, a more appropriate description for the body of Christ, and that is ownership. So their members are not called members, they're called owners. Vintage 21 contends that gyms and clubs have members, and these memberships are painless to obtain and even easier to discard. I think we could all agree. Ownership, on the other hand, they say, springs from the fact that followers of Christ are co-heirs of the kingdom and as such possess a piece of the church. Vintage 21 hopes each person will feel responsibility for the church and want to be more intimately involved rather than just coming to services and then taking off. They hope to ditch a consumer mindset and move into an investor's outlook. Can you imagine that if everybody looked at the church as something they invested in? An owner, they say, makes the organization happen. Jesus wants his followers to make the church happen, to go out and love people, to nurture each other, to serve with your whole life. Ownership, they say, is a higher calling than membership. Now, I'm not proposing we make that change, okay? This is not a business meeting. We're not, you know, I'm not proposing any changes along those lines. However, friends, I do believe they have a great point. And I believe the point simply is this, friends, that Jesus wants us to take ownership and responsibility for our churches, for our families, for our workplace, for our neighborhoods, for our communities, friends, and for our world. If we would, then our world would be a better place. Amen. So here's the question for you. What is God calling you to take ownership and responsibility of? Oh, but pastor, I, I can't be a leader. I can't, I can't, I, I don't know that I can lead anything. I, I don't know that I'm qualified for that. Listen, isn't that what Moses was doing? Ah, uh, but, 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 but. Listen, um, you can be a leader without having an official position. 
in every group of people, I believe there are, there are individuals who can lead that group of people in a positive direction, and there are others who can lead that group of people in a negative direction. And there are some that are just following whichever way the strongest person leads. Simply put, friends, do you have the faith to take ownership and responsibility for what God has laid on your heart? That may be as simple as one person, one life on the board, or it may be something greater that God's calling you to. I don't know, friends, but would you be willing to say yes to Jesus? You know what he's speaking to you about today. Would you say yes? Let's pray. Thank you.